Today we're going to have um, a guest presentation by Dr. Eli Fieldsteel, a, an assistant professor of music or associate? Assistant. Assistant professor of music at uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and also director of the computer music studios there or the experimental music studios uh, at Illinois. And we're super happy to have you today and we're excited to hear what you have to talk about and present to us. Many of you may know um, Dr. Fieldsteel as the um, creator of many super collider tutorials online, kind of the go-to tutorials for those who are interested in learning the super collider programming language for audio. And uh, many others might know him for his compositional work, um, either for um, new instruments for musical expression or for instrument and electronics or fixed media. Um, all of these things are um, things that he does well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over um, and let's begin the presentation. As always, if you would mute your microphones and type the questions into the chat, if you have them or comments, um, and I will take the chore of fielding those comments and um, interrupting our guest presenter when, when I feel it's necessary uh, in order to alert him to a question. So with that, I turn it over to you. Thanks, John. And hey, everybody, it's very good to be here. Um, yeah, I appreciate the, uh, appreciate the uh, participation. So uh, I've, I'm just, I've brought um, a device with me, which is over here uh, in, the, in the Zoom session as Light Matrix. Uh, this is a, an instrument I've built uh, over the past two years. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, a little bit about me, about my work, sort of uh, what I've done that's led me to this, how it works, and I'll give a kind of a demonstration um, uh, and, and uh, do a short, short performance of a solo piece that I've composed using this instrument. Um, all right, so I have a few um, images. Um, it's a little presentation I prepared. It's not even a PowerPoint. It's just, it's just image files in preview because I can't, can't be bothered. Um, so yeah, this is Light Matrix. It's, um, it's, a, it's basically a control surface that is light sensitive. It's got 256 light sensors arranged in a 16 by 16 grid. And it's got a little uh, Arduino on board that takes all these values and, and basically digitizes them and sends them out USB. I can plug it into my computer. And uh, on the other end, the computer just sees 256 um, live uh, numbers. They're 10-bit numbers. So it's just from 0 to 1023. And uh, I, can, I can use those numbers in any, in any program capable of receiving data over a serial connection. So. It's, it's really quite flexible. I'm using it for music, but there's really no reason it can't be used for video or controlling some other aspect of a multimedia performance. So I've, I've composed um, two pieces with it so far. Uh, one is um, a piece for tenor saxophone and, uh, and light matrix that I perform on, and it's called Depth of Field. Uh, that's been performed a couple of times. And I've also got a solo piece, which is called Impulse Curve. That's the one I'm going to be performing later today. And um, there's basically two versions of that. One is I perform it and I sort of carefully control when the sounds happen. And the other version is a, an installation where all the sounds are kind of active all the time and participants can come and basically play with it and, and figure out how it works. Um, all right, so back in like 2011, 2012, 2013, I was a graduate student at the University of Texas. And um, the, the music, the, the, uh, the computer music studios there uh, collaborate with the dance department and the uh, integrated media students on an annual basis in a, a multimedia concert called Ears, Eyes, and Feet. So everybody sort of groups themselves together. Like, so there's like a choreographer, an integrated media student, a you know, video designer or something, and a composer. And we all sort of work together on these pieces. So this is a screenshot of a video of a, of a multimedia performance that I did the sound for called Genetic Anomalies. And uh, these two dancers, they each have a, a Wiimote a Nintendo Wiimote on their forearm, and they also have a second one on one of their legs. And so all of the music is kind of generated in real time here. So they move, causes the video to change, uh, it's, and causes the audio to change. It's all, it's all live. So that's on my YouTube channel as well. This is a, a shot of me performing at the New York City Electronic Music Festival, a piece called Invisible Ink, which is an eight-channel improvised work for um, Wacom tablet. And... Um, uh, this is me performing at Ball State University, where I, I taught for a year a piece called Brain Candy, which is for sensor gloves, which um, uh, it's a quadraphonic work, and the piece kind of begins with sort of opening and closing the hands, which has the effect of dropping 
ping pong balls or sounding like ping pong balls are being dropped. I think all I the think room. that was actually performed here one time as well. You're right. It was at Seamus when uh, Georgia yeah. Southern hosted it. Yes, that was the piece that was on that that conference. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah. Um, so th uh, this is this was a uh, this was a, a, a controller. I created these sensor gloves when I was at Ball State because I was uh, hired to um, uh, fill in for Mike Pounds, who was on sabbatical that year. And he teaches a course called Human Computer Interface Design. And I had never done anything like even remotely related to that. And I thought, you know what, now is probably the right time to figure out what the, what the hell I'm doing. So <laughs> I, uh, John and I were just talking about this. Being, being required to teach a subject is arguably the best way to learn it. <laughs> So um, uh, I, I got really excited about sensor-driven music and using Arduino, Raspberry Pi, Bella boards, and all sorts of little microprocessors to take real-world data um, and and use it to generate and control sound. Um, yeah, so that was that was a lot of fun. And uh, when I got to Illinois, um, in my position now I oversee some music technology senior capstone projects. So uh, two students. Um, uh, Wataru on the right and Casey on the left, uh, doing their sort of giving their open house presentations. Wataru has like a sensor driven. It's kind of like a little bit like Dance Dance Revolution, I guess, and that you can step on it and you know things happen. <laughs> He's a, Shout out to Wataru, a graduate of Georgia Southern's music. Is that right? Master's oh, wow, that's right. He's in. Uh, oh, that's right. He's Japan there. now. I think uh, with Sony, maybe. I can't believe I did not even uh, uh, remember that when I was putting this together. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay. Uh, so anyway, I, I thought, okay, let's do a, like a go big or go home sensor project. So the idea was to build this, you know, this light sensor board over here. So I, I put in a, a grant application and got some money to buy some parts. So I got a bunch of, you know, header pins, multiplexers, Arduinos, breadboards, uh, way too many resistors. That's, that's those on the, but I mean, you know, they, there's a real big price cut when you buy in bulk. So. Uh, that's you know I, I still have about ninety nine point nine 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 percent of those resistors. <laughs> um, so I started doing some tests, just kind of figuring out how the uh, multiplexer works, and like just getting two. So I have two two light sensors, kind of just plugged in over here, just making sure I understand uh, multiplexing. For anyone who's, who's not familiar, is um, it's a, it's a way of encoding multiple analog inputs on a single analog connection. So it's, think of it like a um, like a remote control for your TV. Like the TV is, is, is got all these channels, but you can only really listen to one at a time. So multiplexer is like an automatic sort of thing that, that cycles through your channel. It's like channel surfing, basically. And so the multiplexer is programmed to uh, cycle through 16 inputs. So just kind of like the way a you know, TV, like the CRT TV does the sort of bars going top to bottom, top to bottom, that sort of thing. Um, so I started doing some measurements and, and saying, okay, I, I think get the ruler out, uh, start putting in the multiplexers and the... Um, photo cells, and actually wiring all of this. Uh, I actually did some live streaming over the summer in, I think it was 2018. So you can catch some of these archived streams on my YouTube channel. It's just me building the thing and just listening to music. Um, so it started to it started to really come together. This is um, uh, actually linking all the multiplexers together. The idea was to have 16 multiplexers, um, one for each row. And then, uh, so basically I could, uh, uh, Read read an array an array of sixteen values at a time. So this was actually a lot, a lot like the CRT televisions, where you sort of hit the top bar and the next bar and the next bar and the next bar. So it's um it's a serial process. I can't sort of read all the values at once. I have to kind of channel change in a very clever way. I had some help from one of my grad students. This is T J Sapp, who knows a lot about woodworking. So he helped build a box for it. And uh, so just a few more pictures here. I, I actually built a top for the box. Um, so that that would actually go over it, and so only the little photo cell, cell heads would poke out. Um, but they, you know, they're standing up pretty tall, like over, over here. So I, I was really getting kind of nervous. I'm like, how am I going to get this top on? Uh, uh, so here's here's the um, here's the box without the top, and um, I actually figured, okay, I the if you can see here, there's just so many wires. It's like I, I got, I, got a, I think that's five rows. I think I got seven rows completed. Uh, and then I said, okay, you know what? I've confirmed, I, and I got the seven rows working. There's a bunch of little videos just like documenting this on my YouTube channel as well, which is just like, I got one row. And so it's me just sort of waving, waving my fingers over just one of the rows and then two rows and then five rows. And, uh, and I said, okay, uh, I'm at University of Illinois. We got a stellar engineering program. And I, I remember, or some, uh, actually it was Carla Scaletti, who's a, the um, 
person, she's in charge of a symbolic sound that makes the, the Kima system, the Kima hardware and software. And she says, you know, they have a class. It's uh, Engineering 445, which is a uh, senior design. And basically, they all have to do, every, every engineering student has to do a senior project. And so I got in touch with the TAs and said, can I, come, can I come shop this project? Like, can I show it to your students? And so I brought this prototype in. And they were all kind of like, whoa, oh my god, you know, it makes music and you wave your hands over it. And they, they really were into it. And uh, so I had like four or five groups sort of petition to like do this project. And I, I sort of interviewed them all. And I, I came up with one, one group. They had some really good ideas. They had some, uh, I mean, they all, all, all the ideas were roughly the same. They were just like, we'll make some printed circuit boards and to, to sort of make far fewer moving parts. Because this, this version here, like you can't travel with this. You can't even really take it in a car. If you go over a bump, everything flies out. And you know you're you're screwed. Like you've, you 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 got to turn around, right? No no conference for you. Uh, so they um they they designed these printed circuit boards, and basically each one has 16 slots for photocells and a, a, a spot for um a multiplexer on the on the other side. So uh, it's a really compact design, and so there were 16 of these made all together, and these students uh, put all the photocells in and did all the wiring kind of underneath. So here it is, kind of all loosey goosey, and uh, I had. Uh, I, uh, I had TJ help me build a, a second box sort of with the dimensions. I also had this custom road case ordered. Um, and then here I am. I, I sort of took it off their hands. I got some uh, polycarbonate. Wait, no, I always mix it up. It's, it's it, One of these things that I mix it up with is the thing that Han Solo gets frozen in in, in Star Wars. That's carbon. Um, carbonite. That's carbonite. carbonite yeah. yeah, this is this is carbonate or polycarbonate. It's some, some, some sort of glossy, uh, you know, firm material that it's like pl plexiglass kind of. It's not exactly plexiglass, but you can score it and then snap it. So it's really easy to work with. So um, anyway, yeah, here's the, the final the final product. Here's we're sort of rehearsing for a performance. This is um, you can see the saxophones in the background. This is me work, working with Nathan Mandel. He put on a show. We performed this piece. Um, it was a lot of fun. And my friend Jake Metz, who is the uh, uh, he's the um, he's a, a, techn a, me a technology specialist in the Creative Commons uh, portion of the uh, division of the library system at Illinois. So he just he's all about the new technology, cutting edge stuff. He put on a uh, a festival called Immersion Festival, and kind of the highlight of it was this geodesic dome with uh, I think it was eighteen speakers, eighteen speakers, sort of a three three sort of rings. It was like uh, nine, six, and three. I think you know it's, it's no real standard way of doing these things, but um, so I, I I composed a, another piece, uh, different sound, same instrument, uh, which was uh, meant to be interactive and sort of user friendly. So it's these three sounds. You can come and you can wave your hand over it, and and uh, and sounds happen. It was a lot of fun. That looks amazing. How did you handle the spatialization? Uh, well, the first thing I did is that's a good question. I I there's 18 speakers and 16 printed circuit boards. So I just said, I'm just going to ignore two of the speakers in the topmost ring and just treat that as a singular point source speaker. And what I did was I sort of roughly mapped the, uh, the PCBs to the speakers so that uh, I, I'm not going to exactly remember what was what, but I think it was like one, one of these in the middle was the top speaker and the other three were, or actually the, the remaining five, was it? One, two, three, four, five. Something like that. Like these, these here were kind of like the middle ring, and then the outermost one, the outermost ring, kind of along the sides, was the the bottom ring. And so I just kind of, um, yeah, just cooked up some code that basically uh, it would, it would ca calibrate the sort of or measure the the light and dark balance on each uh, uh, collection of sixteen cells, and then adjust the amplitude in that speaker. So it's kind of nice because you could sort of move your hands, uh, kind of like this, from like the sides, from the sides in. And uh, uh, eventually, uh, you know, you, you could sort of sweep your hand over it, and it would it would sound like it's kind of passing over you. So it worked it worked pretty well. Um, yeah, what, one one uh, consequence of uh, this particular design is that you can't, sh if you're working with shadow, you can't shadow uh, one of the central photo cells without casting an arm shadow. If you have like lighting from from the top here. So the edge, the edge is kind of ripe for precise control, where you can cover sort of an individual cell. But um, you know, once you get towards the middle, you're just dealing with big blobs of shadows. But um, anyway, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into the code. Um, is there a sorry? Is there a question? Thought oh, I heard something. I thought I did too. Mm. <laughs> well, I didn't. So, I didn't even think about the shadows. That's kind of interesting. Right. Um, in fact, oh, you know, I, did, I should have brought that with me, but I, um, 
Well, first of all, you can do you know flashlight stuff, right? That's all. That's all kind of fair game. Uh, but I, I went to the Fab Lab at Illinois. We have we have this Fab Lab, which is really great. And I just kind of had a had like a consultation with someone, and um, uh, we we ended up uh, building a a three D printed ring, which is um, you know it's it's got like a a, ba a a lithium battery on the top and a LED on the bottom, and uh, it's um. Uh, it's, it's got a little switch on it, so you can sort of turn the light on and off. So you have it, and you can kind of wave it, wave it like this, you know. So you, it's in my office. I didn't go ahead and grab it today, but so th there's some some possibilities, sort of ripe for, for new experiments. Um, I was hoping to build more of those and kind of refine the design a little bit, but didn't quite get there. Um, now everything's kind of shut down. So you know, what are you gonna do? Um, yeah. Anyway, this is, you can, if, if I think a lot of you, I think, know about my YouTube channel already, but uh, it's just my first and last name, so you can see, see some more videos of some of this stuff in action. Um, so could right. you tell me a little more again about, so there's a Creative Commons um, thing that somebody works in, there's a library resource for this, or? Uh, it's, it's, oh, sorry, I think I said Creative Commons, I meant Media Commons. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Media Commons, it's, uh, it's basically, I mean, the, the area that Jake sort of overseas is like the uh, acquisition and rental of like cameras and audio stuff and, and all sorts of, they have like a media lab. And so students can like put together kind of like video projects with a lot of high-end gear. Um, they can, I think they've got like game controllers too. So it's just like a, he's, um, yeah, he's just kind of specializing in, he does a lot of stuff with uh, ambisonics and like massively multi-channel um, protocols. So he's, he's really interested in that sort of stuff, which is why he, built that dome and uh you know basically put out a call for works for it so wow what a resource yeah it's really great it's it's nice to be friends with the guy you know we go out and have beers and stuff and talk about stuff it's, it's a lot of fun yeah um okay so i uh, i'll show you some code to actually put this thing put this thing to work all right so super collider uh, programming language uh i eat sleep and breathe it it's it's been a really liberating experience learning this platform over the last 12 years it's really changed the way i think about uh digital audio and and signal processing it's it's just it's just fantastic so um the first thing i'd like to do is just give you well walk you through my the, the process of composing immediately after the device was built and, and kind of robust so the first thing i did is i just wanted to make something in super collider that would receive the values and display them in a way that I could confirm it was working correctly. Um, it took a little bit of, um, quite a bit of weird uh, array manipulation gymnastics. Um, I think the main thing I'm thinking, um, you know, just like here, here, this stuff here, it's like, because of the way they're designed, it's like 16 cells on one PCB. Um, so it's like that, that one is like sort of uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, and then like 17 actually starts over here. So if you want to read these left to right from all the way from the left to the right and then top to bottom, you have to, oh God, you know, it's just like you have to, you have to cook those arrays. So this is like, uh, oh man, uh, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of flop. No, maybe not in this one. I think it's, uh, do you know if anyone has created a, a sort of matrix class in Super Collider that would handle this? Uh, well, there's a Array 2D, yeah. which is, uh, I think, which I actually ended up using. Um, that's that's pretty useful. But you can also just do this with a regular array by putting arrays inside of arrays. But yeah, sure. Um, I mean, there's a lot of array methods like flop and clump and and things like that, which which just like make subarrays and and flatten the array to a, a one dimension. Anyway, it's, it's not. We don't have to get too deep into that. I just want to. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it took a lot of work to actually get it to display correctly. So um, it just reads data from the serial port, and, and here are the numbers. And the first thing I noticed was that there's a lot of um, uh, what's what's the word? I mean, it, uh, it's they're they're not very uniform. I mean, they're just little analog sensors, and so there's like um, discrepancies between them. You can't expect them to output the exact same voltage, even if the light source were somehow perfectly uniform across the the board. Um, you know, some of them are just like a little bit higher or lower than the others in terms of their um what's the what's the i'm thinking you know, like resistors have a, a tolerance a tolerance. tolerance yeah right so the tolerance varies quite a bit in these enough so that I, I can't really and then imagine i take this out of the studio into another studio or into a performance hall or somewhere else the lighting's going to be completely different every time i'm not always going to have complete control so the first thing i noticed was there's a very strong need 
for a calibration algorithm, something which, which you know, says this right here, this is our baseline, this is rest position, this is equilibrium. So that's the point of this, and it's fairly simple. The idea is once you're all set up, ready for sound check, the um, superclider takes a, a snapshot of, of, the, uh, of the board and all of the numbers. It says that that's, it calls that normal, right? And that's, that's this capture thing here. Uh, and and then what it does, it's it's on a loop. It, it runs at a frame rate and it loops the following function, which just continually takes the difference between the current live values and that capture. So if nothing changes, everything is zero. And then if you make things darker, uh, the numbers go negative. And if you shine a flashlight on them, the numbers get higher. And then I, I also um, map them, uh, or I guess normalize them is, is the right word here. So, so that they are between zero and one. So one kind of represents maximum brightness and zero represents maximum darkness. And I needed to curve them too because the way photocells behave is like sort of as soon as you give them even the slightest bit of shadow, they just shoot down to a, a really uh, low level. Like it's really easy to, to make the values lower. And then as you get lower and lower, you really have to fully, fully, fully cover them to get them all the way down. So it's kind of a weird unmusical velocity curve for lack of a better word. And so I, um, I use the Lin curve here to actually kind of try to force that curve into something that's more musical. Like if I mapped it directly onto a frequency, it wouldn't go like, it, you'd think it would, but no, it goes like, yeah. and it's, it's really obnoxious to work with. So it took a little bit of massaging to kind of get the numbers right. But anyway, once you run this, then uh, I think then we can just check this uh, LM variable and everything is kind of nice and really uniform. That should be around 0.75, but I can I can just like adjust the the light a little bit so it's uh you know not quite on it. And then we can um, kind of do this again. It gets those and capture these. And now it's uh, you know it doesn't have to be perfect, right? If this were an actual concert, I'd I'd spend more time tweaking the curvature values and the position of the actual lamp, but we're gonna call that good. And then this last code just brings up a little window, which is just a, a graphical user interface. It's just a bunch of little squares that turn black when I cover them and uh, light when, when, when they're lit. So, you know, so I can say hello, so here there, and this is my hand, I can sort of move it around. You know, it's very low resolution, but it's 256 values, it's quite a lot of, quite a lot to work with musically. It doesn't look good, but you know, so. Yeah, so it's pretty easy to cover just one of these here. Very precise. Yeah, we have some questions. Someone says, um, could you possibly illuminate from the bottom and sides to eliminate shadows? Or would that lessen the sensitivity? Um, let me, so I'm not quite sure. Uh, could you uh, illuminate, from the illuminate from the bottom and sides? So okay. just to eliminate yeah. shadows, I guess, on the... Uh, uh, yeah, I, su I suppose you could. Um, that would be something to experiment with, I think. Yeah, that would be, that would be interesting. And then a second question says, uh, is this something, are you able to chip away at a project like this in small chunks of time, or is it something you need an hour to even make a small adjustment? Um, uh, these projects, like, do you mean the code, or do you mean... Uh, this was regarding the hardware, I think. Oh, uh, I, I think I just spent a lot, I, I devoted several days uh, of just like, I'm just gonna, you know, today I'm gonna just spend six hours just like uh, figuring out, you know, this, this one project. So it, it takes time for sure. I mean, it was nice to have these engineering students who basically designed the PCBs and kind of put it together about 70, 80% of the way. Um, and then uh, it, the, the, big, the big project for me was designing this code that would pull the raw values from the serial port and you know reorganize them and m map them and normalize them so that they were like zeros and ones from 1 to 256 from left to right top to bottom that was that was like a, a couple of like maybe a month i think of like really you know in the studio diagnosing and that sort of stuff so anyway yeah this is uh this was like my initial tester and and even as you can if you just put your hand over the light you can see there's the variance there right there's there's some which are uh, a little bit darker a little bit lighter so even even calibrating, there's a little bit of drift, there's a little bit of irregularity. It's not perfect, but it's it's definitely uh, precise enough to make music with it. Um, all right, so the next thing I did is I sort of started making um, sounds. And uh, 
So that's we're gonna do. We're gonna start this up here again, and make sure we got numbers. Oh yeah, so now they're a little bit lower. I think it's because the curve value is different in this file. Let's try that again. Ah, that looks nice. A lot of seventy fives. Yeah. Um, you know, it doesn't doesn't. I could have made like, if I'm if I'm only gonna be shadowing and not putting light on it, I could have made this you know, 0.999 or whatever. But I think by having it not uh, at one, it does give me the option of like shining a light on it. And so now you can see some of those values are higher. So you it gives me it gives me like bi bipolarity. Yeah, you have headroom. Right, exactly, yeah. So I, I can I can shine a light on it and I can shadow it and I can, I can uh, do musical things with either one of those things. If I set this to be like, this is one and I can only make it darker, then I have less musical options. Um, okay, so I just made this, I'll walk through this very simple um, demo here, and awesome. So I just, here's like a, the, I'm kind of start simple and work my way, um, work my way up. So here's like a basic sine wave, and I thought, all right, let's just like make sure I can make one of these photocells act like a volume slider on like a mixer. All right, so that's this one in the bottom, 240 is the one in the bottom left corner right here. So I can cover that up, and it stops. And so, uh, you know, it, if you want to do like a, a slow fade, you can't do one of these things like this because it, it kind of uh, kind of shuts up really quickly, right? So like, that's, you know, that's not working. But what you can do is you can put your finger kind of close to it and then roll it over, something like this. Or maybe maybe take your thumb and kind of cover it slowly. If you make kind of like um, you know like a, a half moon, then it's it's kind of like half covered, and that that gets the job done. It it'll it'll you know the values will um, uh, you know ramp. I look forward to the paper on performance practice of the light matrix. Yeah, I got to get writing on that. <laughs> uh, someone asked, does it work with laser pointers? I haven't tried that. I don't have any laser pointers. I should get one. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so here, here's like the opposite. Very easy to invert the values. So now it's quiet and now it's loud. Yeah, different sound. And it's pretty responsive too, which is nice. Um, I had to tweak like how, how fast the Arduino is working. I think I ended up doing a delay in like microseconds just to really try to, there's a delay microseconds method. So I think it's like uh, like half of a millisecond or something. I was curious about that with the multiplexing. If mm -hmm. if the latency is consistent, uh, it seems very consistent from everything I've done. Uh, the Arduino is it's got one job and it does that job very well. And in fact, the the engineering students came up with a slight design improvement. They had they added a seventeenth multiplexer, which is this thing here, which uh, basically acts as a multiplexer for the sixteen multiplexers coming in. So it's like two hundred fifty six channels into sixteen into one. And then the Arduino is is um, just powering through all all two fifty six of those values. So I think there's like um, uh, it the 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 microsecond delay of like five hundred microseconds happens uh, after an entire collection of two hundred fifty six goes through. So it's not waiting between individual values. It's it's really going a mile a minute. But you know it doesn't. I mean I can't really like touch it to see if it's hot because it's like behind the the glass but it's I've left it I've left it running for many many hours and it's and I come back and it's still working so hey you know it's, great it's, yeah so uh let's let's see um this here we uh so we could do a chord thing um actually let me just uh I think I stopped these yeah uh so if we do this I think this is a chord on the bottom PCB yeah, so it's a one note for each for each cell, basically. the idea and from from there it's pretty easy to expand that out so now taking the average of each PCB so it's like the same chord but 
on on the full scale of the board, which uh, works like this. All right, and then just to that synthesis, let's let's talk about sampling for a second. So I have a prayer bowl being struck, and we can just threshold that first photocell. So when it's uh, lower than some value, make a sound. All right, just that one down there. Uh, so here I put a, a, a different transposition of that sample on each of the PCBs. So it's kind of like uh, big, big clunky wind chimes. Uh, let's see. Oh, I got to do this. And here we have kind of the problem with uh, if you want to trigger one in the center, you really can't do it without triggering a few on the way. Right? I can't really get that. So you just kind of have to kind of play with it, you know, it's, you, you get what you get. Yeah, maybe you need a matrix of 256 laser pointers that you interact <laughs> with. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Uh, uh, and then, uh, okay, so this is just for fun. Here's a, a, a unique sample on each, each one, so 256. Uh, sample players and so I, here I can just pick one and play it just so you can hear it's like microtonally tuned and uh, here is I'm just gonna play them I, this, this code just plays them all one at a time they're also panned all right 256 uh, and here here is the um, the actual oh. Oh, that seems like a, what is that? Let's see, let's recalibrate this and maybe that'll fix it. <laughs> uh, didn't do that earlier. Um, okay, so yeah, I think I just have to make, yeah, I should probably, uh, I think that's the, that's probably the issue. Um, so let's see, that, that, huh? Uh, less than. Mm. I am not sure what's going on here. Uh, I must have changed some number somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> what are what are these values? Seventy five. So, tr yeah, it says if it's less than. Uh, maybe I need to do here. Yeah, I was going the wrong direction. Right, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, okay. So, here we go. Yeah, the way I've got it set up, uh, as far as that uh, panning goes, is um, uh, basically, you know, it's, it's 256 players that are just basically getting re-triggered when the corresponding cell goes dark. And the ones over here are, are panned to the right, and then it's like a... Yeah, the ones over here are panned to the left, so... 
um, so that you can actually, I, you know, it's, the visual sort of space is linked with the audio space. So. Um, and then what's really, what that, for that first sound you heard, like if I turn off the light, you get the sort of laser beam effect. <laughs> because it triggers them all at once and because they're all the same sample but tuned, you know, equally apart, you get this kind of comb filtering glissando, which is pretty, pretty fun. Kids love that one. <laughs> yeah. It seems very responsive and sensitive. So I think that that mapping of the curve is very effective. Yeah. It, that, that, that was a big part of it, really making it so that uh, it's reliable, right? It's really, really important for that to be. I wondered when you showed that if, if there was um, a known transfer function for those particular resistors that you could, that you could use instead of just a generic curve. Hmm. That is a good question. I, I have not investigated that. I bet. I mean, I know the data sheets usually come with a uh, sort of how, how the voltage behaves as a as a function of lumens or something. So uh, I think that that would be worth checking into, um, just in case I can refine my my curving. All right. So um, uh, with that, I um, let's see. Is there any, I don't. Are there any? Uh, Outstanding There's questions. Question: Someone says I've done some composition in Super Collider and it nearly killed me. <laughs> uh, I think he was doing a pretty big piece. Uh, did you adopt any specific mindsets or techniques to work efficiently in Super Collider, like templates for compositions? N no, I don't really work with templates specifically. But the, I mean, with with something like this, which is like heavily improvised and and just like very sort of free form, like it's not sort of like. X amount of seconds go by, and then event two, and then event three. It's not. I'm not thinking. I'm thinking in terms of states. So I, I basically start in a very impro imp code improvisatory way. Like when I'm actually writing the code, I make a sound. I'm like, what, what sound do I want to hear? So maybe it's synthesis or sampling or microphone based. But I'll just build that function and play it so that it sounds nice. And then I'll kind of add arguments as a way of allowing the data to control those sounds. And then I, I from there, I just basically construct some code that is consistent with a state-based uh, compositional approach, which is like I have, I have five sound objects or sound um, processes, and they can be on or off at any time. And so I, I, I devise a method for turning it on, turning it off, and then like, I, you know, so it's, it's just activating certain processes and deactivating them. So it's, it's quite, it's kind of organic. I mean, it's like I'll just kind of build, build the piece, like kind of figuring out the code and writing the piece are very, linked together like i'll just start with one sound and like say okay let's see if i can make this filter sweep happen when i darken the photo cells and then i'll be like oh you know it sound nice like a chorus effect so i'll add that into the sound and oh you know if i if i uh, maybe if i cover the photo cells at the top that should emphasize the chorus effect and down here at the bottom that should sort of disable it a little bit and so it's just it's very piece by piece and it's very kind of touch and go and just what 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 kind of thing do i want to hear and then i'll refine it so it's 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 um yeah it's kind of like free jazz or something it's just just making it up as I go. Well, I think it's a pretty interesting way to think about music as a um, a set of states and a morphology through those states based on parametric control. I mean, exactly. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I think this, all of the pieces I've written with Super Collider either follow an event based chronology or a state based uh, environment where things can freely happen. Like there's, there's a set of things that can happen and. You just have to define the processes that make those things happen. So I have a question. You know, what is the? There's got to be some other things that you you draw from for an instrument like this. You know, I mean, there's the idea, but probably there's some things that inspired you. Are there other instruments that maybe you draw from, or uh, maybe subconsciously? Yeah. But I don't. I don't think I do. Like, I, I, what's most attractive about this, and a lot of the pieces I've done earlier, like some of those photos I shared, like the Wacom tablet and the the uh, choreography and the Wiimotes, is like it's just a it's a kind of a novel controller, and it's it's just provides a refreshing way to think about real time control of music. And so I, the my process usually in, involves taking the controller and saying, what can it do? What are the range of parameters I can work with here? What can I reproduce reliably? How high does it go? How low does it go? How fast does it go? And then I just sort of take note of those parameters, and um, and then I start writing some sound producing code. And and for making the sound code, I've just I think I've just fallen into certain habits over the years where I I gravitate towards certain combinations of unit generators, uh, or I I just um, you know I'll take an existing instrument or synth def from a previous piece and say okay let's see if I can 
turn these knobs a little bit and make it a little bit different. But, you know, I, I just like kind of um, uh, just rich ambience and um, textural composition, something which, which is right on the, I really like the, the sort of spot right between recognizable tonality and kind of atonality. So there's like a little bit of a, a flavor for, for people to recognize whether you're really into like the crazy stuff with the atonal stuff or you're really into like, you know, the sort of cliche YouTube binaural beats videos, which is just like lovely C major chord for three hours. You know, it's, I don't know. It's, I, I think there's just things that I think sound good to me and then I get, get a pretty good reaction from listeners. And so, I don't know. I don't think there's any specific instruments I was thinking of just kind of like sound worlds that I thought would be a good fit for this particular control paradigm. Um, yeah, okay, I've got a, a piece actually, a full, a full piece instead of this like demo, um, which I want to share. This, this is the code that was originally used in the Immersion Festival with the 18-channel geodesic dome. And uh, basically I defined three, three um, types of sounds. You'll, uh, I'll, I'll kind of go through afterwards and, and walk you through what each one does. But there's like three sounds and there's, a, there's a, a, a mapping from light sensors to that sound. And so one of them is kind of like big picture mapping, like the whole, the whole board reacts to it, or, or the, the sound reacts to the entire board, like a big average. Uh, another one is kind of column based. So it's like rows of cells do different things. And then the last one is actually kind of an inverted way of thinking it, like the fewer photo cells I cover, the more active it becomes. But then as I cover more photo cells, it, it, it becomes less and less um, active. So uh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and play this. I, and uh, I, I actually, well, no, I'll just, I'll just play it. We'll talk about it afterwards. I think there'll be a lot of, a lot of fun things to talk about. So this is like a five, usually a five to six minute improvisation.
So that's, that's kind of how the piece goes. Um, oh, really nice. Thank you. It's great. Wow. Yeah. So it's a lot of fun. It's kind of evolved over uh, over the, you know, the, it's, there's like two versions of that. There's that version and then the the, uh, the installation version is kind of all the sounds are on all the time and um, kind of like the, so, you know. Um, what struck me was, was thinking about um, how when you were at UT Austin, mm -hmm and this ears, eyes, and feet, and this sort of gestural movement of the body. And, and these, these ideas seem to have stayed with you, right? I mean, we have this sort of, this yeah. movement here, which is like gathering, gathering light or gathering water or something, and actually yeah. cast, casting darkness on the instrument. Very effective. Thanks. Yeah, I, um, it's, it's certainly collaboration with dancers has heightened my awareness of sort of performative movement. Uh, and there are other things. I mean, you know, I was uh, it's, um, tangentially related. I was in um, I was a drama club in high school, so it's not like I've never been on stage before. Uh, I, I feel like I kind of have a, an extroverted personality. I, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't feel weird being on stage and kind of hamming it up a little bit. And I was also in a, um, a summer uh, youth circus when I was a uh, even you know, younger before high school. So I was like juggling and unicycling and, you know, da -da, doing all that stuff. So it's, uh, there's lots of things I've encountered in my life, which I think have contributed to um, like a, 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 a comfort, a sort of a level of, um, you know, feeling, feeling uh, at home on stage and kind of performing. So it's well, the same thing with like the sensor glove piece and, and stuff like that, you know, same ideas. So there's some questions here. Someone right asks, uh, is it possible to play a wrong note in this environment? Or does this work with pretty much any gesture you throw at it? Oh yeah, it pretty much works with everything. I mean, there's, it's there. Are, uh, you can just hear from the pitch language. There's kind, of, there's a kind of homogeneity to it. Like there's, um, it's, it's kind of like in a in a diatonic key with like a, a certain percentage of wrong notes. So it's like you'll you'll it, with the with the the chord pad texture and the and the bells. They're all carefully programmed to like provide what I think is a tasteful balance of like uh, tonal familiarity and wrong notes. But no, you can you can just. I mean, that's the the kind of point of it as an installation. You can't play it incorrectly so that seems you know. to be sort of a repeated theme i'm noticing amongst um this presentation series is is there sort of this balance between what is virtuosity um is it is there a physical virtuosity that's necessary or is this mostly the virtuosity of the mind in preparation um a musical virtuosity that that sort of comes out in the programming and the, and the building and the construction of the piece oh, that's very interesting uh, I think I think both are involved, but probably the musical coding virtuosity is is the stronger component here. Um, I think I think a performance can be enhanced by uh, someone, you know, me or, or someone else who who feel looks gives an aura of confidence and sort of like a, of of intent and purpose. And now I'm going to cover this photo cell, and now I'm going to very carefully, you know, and and there's even a little bit of like. Um, like there's there's kind of a sleight of hand to it. It's a little bit like street magic, where it's like, yeah, I can look all fancy, like I'm doing something crazy. But um, in in a in a in a similar piece, there might be like, I mean, because I uh, I don't know if anyone noticed, but I have this MIDI controller here, <laughs> which is uh, which is pr the the main purpose of this controller is to turn things on and off. Like I want I want that chord pad to turn on. I want it to turn off. And I could have programmed some elaborate or maybe some simple gesture, which is like when I cover these two specific photo cells. Um, th that sound will come on and then I can toggle it off with some other, you know, so it's possible, but I just thought it would be more reliable to just have a, have a button that I can push. And I could have easily done something on my computer keyboard. Um, 
Uh, but it, on the on the tenor saxophone piece that I mentioned earlier, that one I actually do rely on the light sensor to advance the piece. So mm -hmm. there's like a gesture where I push the the conditional logic for advancing the piece using the light sensors is um, there are two photocells that need to be dark on the right edge and the left edge. And the five photocells around each of those need to be light. So I can't sort of accidentally do it by just putting my hands over it. I have to be very specific with my thumbs and say these two. And then I have the screen give me a flash to confirm that I've done it correctly. Um, and so that, it's, uh, I th that works well too if you do it right. But I also think it's a little distracting in a, from a performance context because I think it's uh, people often ask me in that performance, like, what were you doing with your thumbs there? And I'm like, ah, you know, it's supposed to be kind of a seamless thing. But I think it is, people notice that as a, a different gesture. And, like, they want, they don't hear a sound when I do it. So they're like, what is the point of that, you know? So I'm not really sure which, which way is better. But I guess back to the, the original thought of the virtuosity. I, I think that the physical virtuosity helps make it a really, helps, helps sell it, I guess. But it's really all, I think it's mostly in the code and the sounds that, that, uh, yeah, I think that that's where I, that's where a lot of my attention goes. And there's another question regarding, uh, in this particular case, the Fractus three, mm -hmm. I guess the series of Fractus pieces. Yeah. It says for a piece like that, did you think about the general sound form that you wanted and then write the code in traditionally notated flute parts to reflect the piece you had in your head? Did you build a framework for manipulating acoustic instruments and kind of improvise into it? Or do you have a flute piece in your head and then think of something that you wanted to happen to the flute sound and then write code to achieve the events that you had in your head? I think that question is, how do you go about composing the practice pieces? Okay, so the flute piece, I had the really, uh, I'll sort of walk you through the process as best I remember it. It was a while ago, it was 2011, I wrote that piece. Uh, and I met a uh, flutist, Kenzie Slotto, and we, uh, yeah, we started hanging out and she was a really fantastic collaborator. So the, I think the first thing I did is I was like, let me um, get you into the studio and I'm just going to record all of the crazy stuff you can do and also some normal stuff. So I have a huge library, a folder on my computer called Kenzie, and it's like subdivided into like 18 subfolders of like different techniques and like staccato, long tones, piano, forte, whistle tones, jet whistle, you know, all, all the crazy stuff. Um, so and then, and then I think what I did was I, um, uh, I, I didn't, write the code immediately, I, uh, I, I, I started sketching out ideas. I, I had a general shape in mind, which was something sparse and angular and atonal that eventually sort of started coalescing to have a pitch center and a, and a discernible meter. And then that was that's sort of section B, which gradually builds and the spectrum unfolds and you get some bass notes and it, it eventually kind of spirals out of control. And there's this free improv section in the middle, which is the moment that the piece goes from stereo to quadraphonic. And so all of a sudden sounds are spinning around you as the audience. You go six minutes without hearing anything from the back speakers. Uh, and then and then that there's this and Kenzie's a fantastic improviser. So she really went crazy on it. It was great. And um, and then that that dies down and a melody emerges. And you get this chorale sort of out of nowhere, this kind of like almost Disney-esque chorale, which is like, what the hell is that doing there? <laughs> uh, but, and, then that, and then that too sort of like splits apart and, and drifts, and then we get a quick sort of chaotic ending. That was, that was the structure I was working with. Um, so I think some of the first things I did was build, um, yeah, and I started sort of decorating the sketches. Well, actually, I brought it to Kenzie, and I said, what do you think of these? Like, can you play these? Let's do like a sort of rough recording session just so I can hear what they sound like. And... Uh, uh, so it was, it was very, very collaborative. And then I start, I want to have a blob here, some sort of electronic sound here and there. So I think I worked on the code. And the actual engraving in the notation software was like the last thing I did. I always think of that as kind of like dessert after like slaving over a, a, a long meal where it's like I've worked so hard on this code and just like figuring out the musical ideas. Now it's like mindless. I can just put on like some rock and roll music or something and just engrave the piece and I don't even have to hear it anymore. Like I just know what it's going to look like on the score. And doing all the the... Uh, what do you call it? the abstract notation? You know the the. Um, How do you the, accomplish that? The abstract notation. I did that in Finale, and I used the shape designer, and I used the group and ungroup feature. So like you, you be, I just took like a bunch of like rectangles and polygons and like made them different shading. It was very tedious, and then I just sort of grouped them together, and and, and then like made another group, and then just sort of sp so kind of like building building unit by unit, like shape by shape, the the larger things. Yeah, I used Finale. I've I bought Dorico since then, but I really 
so few of my pieces recently have even required the use of notation software. I mean, the tenor sax piece sort of does, but that was only because Nathan was like, I really don't think I can improvise the entire piece. You got to give me some structure. So I got Dorico and I just, it's like the simplest, most embarrassing looking score. It looks like a, like a first year composition student piece. <laughs> it's just, it's really bad, but that's all he needed. You know, it's like, it's not really about the score for me. It's about the sound. And I just use the score as like, I, I only do as much as I need in order to get a good performance and recording out of it. It's interesting you say that the engraving is like dessert. For me, it's like doing the dishes afterwards. And if I could skip it, I would. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Maybe the um, the, abs the gestural notation is like dessert because then yeah. it's like, I don't have to follow any rules here. I just like, you know, what what do I think of when I think of notating this gesture? Like the the, the thumbnail on that video is like the, the sort of four-handed claw, you know, that like it's like my representation of like the sound becoming quadraphonic, which is just, I just, it's like eye-catching. You know, it's just kind yeah. of me spoiling myself a little bit. So what's next on the horizon for you? I mean, where does what are you up to after this? You're going to do some performances with the the light. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, I've got. I mean, I've got flashlights. I've got that ring that I made at the Fab Lab. Um, and my um, there's basically two two collaborations on the horizon. My colleague Kareth Livengood, she's another composition faculty member here. She she's a flute player. And uh, she's written a piece for herself, which is left-handed flute. So she's only using her left hand. And with her right hand, she's like messing around with a Kima uh, iPad sort of interface. And so she's like, can you write me a, a left-handed light matrix piece? And so I'm just going to probably build a bunch of like fun effects, maybe some like looping, uh, loosely structured looping environments where she can cover part of the light sensors and record herself and then play it back or, or just granulate or, you know, just like some some fun improvisatory stuff because she's a, she's a very... Uh, she's a very good improviser as well. She's she formed a, a noise ensemble here at Illinois called you know Noise Cult or something, and nice. uh, I've I performed with them a couple times. So she's really into the experimental, like you know, pointing the mic straight at the loudspeaker and just letting it rip. You know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so she, I'm gonna do a piece for her, and also um, we have a jazz trombone player, uh, and, uh, Justin Macadera, who recently uh, got his master's and his the the the. Pro his project, his master's thesis, was the design and construction of a trombone, which is specifically designed to in, uh, stifle all or like nearly all of the acoustic sound and have a line out, so you so you can play and just go through effects and actually not have the bell and the acoustic part of the trombone. So I thought that's really exciting. I could write him a piece and maybe perform with him on the light sensors and and you know just basically have none of the acoustic trombone and all of the electric trombone. It might be pretty fun. So those, those are two pieces kind of on the immediate horizon. So there's a question here, um, and I'll, I'll tie it into the Fractus stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so those pieces say, you know, for flute and super collider, uh, which is a little different than saying flute and computer or live electronics. So it's, it's like mm -hmm. you're treating super collider as a specific instrument. So someone says, uh, I tend to prefer super collider, but working in Max, a different um, software audio software program for generative music has seemed easier than what I could do in Super Collider. So what are your thoughts specifically in a generative capacity? So I'm tying that to, are those two different instruments? Hmm. Um, you know, have, I guess I'm sure you've worked in both, but you mm -hmm. tend to have gravitated towards Super Collider as your preferred instrument. Right. So um, the, the first, the first question, which was, um, I, uh, the, I'm sorry, I'm losing it. What was what was the? How did she uh, uh, says I tend to prefer Super Collider, but working in Max for generative music seems easier. Uh, and they ask, okay, what, so, are, "What are your thoughts?" So for the generative thing, I, I actually find that pretty surprising. I think Super Collider is fantastically powerful for making sort of thousands of layers with like a single line of code. Uh, so I, I just for just for I, I mean, have you, have you are you familiar with the um, the Super Collider tweets? Uh, like hashtag SC tweets where people put like 140 characters and some of that is like, like sometimes 20 characters are part of a comment. <laughs> right. like they, put, they put space slash slash hashtag super collider tweets and it's, it's like wow you know just you're showing off now but it's but it's a it's a it's a, a line of code that generates it's an infinite uh, and some of them are incredibly sonically complex. Um, I've even done a couple myself it's very hard because you have to know all the syntax gymnastics uh, to, to make it as short as possible. And it's, it's completely unreadable. But um, I, I think Super Collider is really, really good for I mean, Max is good too. I've just always found that Max is, is kind of seems engineered for like sampling and microphone-based stuff and kind of live processing rather than synthesis. 
Like, I, I don't know that Max makes, at least not in my opinion, makes a fantastic, like, synthesizer. Um, and also, it, just for me, I, I, I did Max for a year when I was a grad student, and um, I just can't deal with the um, the clicking, the mouse clicking, and the dragging, and, like, it's just, that that's, sl- it feels like it slows me down by about 500%, and I just... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's I, nothing against Max. Like, it's a it's a great language, and it's fantastic for especially for people who just kind of want to crack into it, and we can actually see everything that's going on. You don't have to kind of visualize it nearly as much. Um, but yeah, I, I'd be curious to see some of your Max generative stuff, or just like if there's any videos of that, because I've never really been convinced it can do too, too much there. Yeah, well, we've got a little uh, a little project. So our class right now, interactive media is is using Max. So so if there's anything of uh, particular interest, I'll I'll shoot you a link to it. That'd be great. And I, I remembered your other question, which was um, uh, how I sort of subtitled my piece, like it's for, for flute and super collider versus flute and electronic sound. And probably if you, if like an archivist were to like look at all of the documentation of that piece, you'd see that it changes like with every program. Like I can never make up my mind. Uh, and I think I would probably not say for super collider these days, because I think that was, I did that at a time when I was really, really excited about Super Collider and I was just like all about the Super Collider and I was like, yeah, this is a Super Collider piece. But you don't say like, you know, fixed media piece for Logic Pro or something. You know, no one, no one cares about the software you're using, at least certainly like lay people generally are like, that's not going to be relevant information for them. They want to know like your musical ideas and like, you know, it's, oh, it's electronic sound. That's meaningful. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm kind of like against uh, 2011, Eli. Like I, I'm like, uh, just say, just say, flute and like electronic sound, or flute and quadraphonics speakers. I, who knows? You know, it's it's really. I I don't think about it too much, but um, I don't think I think of super collider as like an instrument so much anymore. It's just a it's a tool, yeah. right? But I do think it has tendencies. Like you said, it's um, you tend to move toward a different way of writing when you're writing super collider than you would Max. Or, or even like just low, lower level C++ stuff, right? I mean, it's just different tendencies mm-hmm. that are offered by the, by the programs, which I always found fascinating about how do yeah. these, these different things influence musical form even. Um, right. I mean, here you've chosen to move between different states. Um, partly, I think, you know, maybe it's true that it's because Super Collider allows that um, pretty easily. Yeah, it does. I mean, it's a very open language you know this, this is probably why it's so hard to learn and because all the tutorials kind of take a different approach all of the example pieces that come with the super collider download look wildly different from each other and so it's 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 very hard to like find a to lay down some lay down a path for yourself and like well you know what what order do i do things in where's the structure and it's really hard to, to yeah find for instance the, find i mean foothold you use a lot of uh task definitions and i never use that you know mm, um, yeah a perfect example yeah, it's like, I just don't need that. Um, but I could, I just haven't chosen to learn it that way, I suppose. Um, yeah. Well, great. I, I mean, we've run, we've run out of time pretty much. Um, we have more time, really. Um, there's some other questions, but I think I might want to take these offline if you don't mind sticking around for a little bit. And I will end our stream I'm, on yeah. Facebook and uh, stop the recording for a second or just keep recording and nice. trim it later. <laughs> but uh we're, we're very pleased that you chose to, to do this. Um, it's very nice to, to have an expert uh, in these areas and someone actively working on really interesting material and, and instruments to, to do this for us. We're greatly appreciative. And um, yeah, I, I really appreciate you doing it. And I think everyone really benefits from, from hearing what you had to say. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I'm happy to stick around if there are more questions. Okay, well, let me, uh, let me stop this on Facebook.